Welcome to the Habits and Hustle podcast, a podcast that uncovers the rituals, unspoken habits, and mindsets of extraordinary people. A podcast powered by Habit Nest. Now here's your host, Jennifer Cohen. All right, guys, welcome to Habits and Hustle. Um, I have a really good guest today that I'm actually very excited about, so I hope you are too. His name is Dr. Andrew Hill, and he is a cognitive neuroscientist. Um, I say one of the leading ones in the nation. You may, Dr. Andrew, not agree, but I think it's pretty fair to say. Uh, he does something very, very interesting. He uh, does neurofeedback with the place, he's, his, his own place. It's called Peak Brain. Mm-hmm in Los Angeles. He actually has a lot of different places around the country that you can do it. So we're going to get right into it and talk about your brain and how you can optimize your brain. And so welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, Where do we start? There's so much here with you. First of all, what I find so interesting is that this was not something that you kind of were, like I guess we're doing from like very, very early on. You just became not just, but you became, you got a PhD when you were 35. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there something that happened that kind of brought you to this area of work or? I mean, I spent a good decade, more than a decade between like undergrad and grad school just working because you know, as, as one does. Yeah. And I worked in a lot of health and human services uh, fields. I worked in inpatient psych for many years. I worked in group homes with retarded adults who were nonverbal. I worked in addiction, I worked in latency age kid, you know, at-risk kid groups. Um, and in all those environments, I saw not much change. A lot of people were in sort of holding patterns and we called, you know, revolving door clients who just come and go, you know, every few days. And after years of this, I was working in a psych hospital uh, in charge of doing hands-on restraints and teaching people how to do these things. And this was a very violent psych hospital in Massachusetts that was having five or 10 or 15 emergency hands-on codes every single shift around the clock, just 30, 40, you know, uh, a day. And it was a pretty uh, dynamic, dangerous place. And I ended up getting injured and and blew out some discs in my lower back and couldn't do that hands-on work I'd been doing. was looking for something else to do. And so for a while I was in case management with kids and then I ended up going into high tech. And after a few years in high tech, the tech bubble kind of corrected a little bit. I was doing tech evangelism and sales engineering and things, and I was looking for something to do that was um, back in the health and human service, but not in this sort of, you know, cattle call, cattle pen kind of holding pattern for mental health that I'd experienced. And I went and got a job at an outpatient center that worked with autism a lot because I had a lot of experience with that kind of population. And I preferred to do more high-functioning outpatient work by that point. And this was a center in Providence, Rhode Island, um, called the Neurodevelopment Center that was working with autism and ADHD. And I started seeing things change. I saw kids with ADHD eliminate symptoms more often than not. I saw kids with autism start making eye contact and lose sensory integration issues and have language come back every so often. I saw seizures go away and I was just kind of flabbergasted because from, you know, at this point, 15 years experience in mental health, most of these things were non-tractable, non-changeable things that we just kind of managed with medication and didn't have a lot of tools to help people make transformation. And then I was seeing transformation happen here at this new center all the time, you know, most of the time, dramatically. And so this kind of got me thinking, of course, and um, uh, how I described this back then, the field of neurofeedback had three or four big schools of thought that we're all mutually exclusive in how they think the brain works. And yet, they're all getting really good effects. And this is still true today. Now there's more like 10 different ways of approaching the brain and neurofeedback. But they all get really good effects, or most get really good effects. So why don't we start by t- telling people yeah. what exactly is neurofeedback? So neurofeedback is simply a form of biofeedback or exercising your physiology. Uh, most forms of biofeedback will help you exercise something you're aware of a little bit, like your heart rate or your breathing. Um, neurofeedback exercises things you're not really aware of, like your blood flow in your brain or the electricity in your brain called brain waves. So um, this field's been around since about 1967. Uh, it was discovered sort of accidentally at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Barry Sturman was working with cats and NASA went to him and said, look, uh, astronauts are getting sick breathing in rocket fuel vapors. Please figure out how dangerous this methylhydrazine stuff is. And so Sturman uh, was a learning scientist, still is, um, 
and he, this is back in the 60s, animal testing was a bit different than it is now, mm -hmm. so, you know, with that context, uh, bear with me for a moment. He would take plexiglass cages and put cats inside of them, a cat, and put a beaker of rocket fuel in the cage and close the door. Oh, wow. And just wait. And the vaporized rocket fuel would make the cat sick. And they would, they would drool, they would cry, they would stumble and be dizzy, they would have seizures, coma, and die. And he did this about 32 or so cats, and of those, about 24 had a perfect dose-dependent curve. More minutes exposed to vapor meant more symptoms. Around 40 minutes to an hour in, they had seizures. But eight of the cats were super cats and refused to have seizures and needed two and a half hours of exposure before they showed these instability events in the brain. And he couldn't figure out why some of the cats were seizure resistant, but most of the cats were not. And then he realized that six months before or something, he'd done another experiment with these super cats to see if he could raise a brainwave. They make a lot of anyways by squirting chicken broth into their mouth whenever it showed up. And they did, they got this brainwave trained up it's through this mm -hmm. biofeedback process. And interesting, put them back in the subject pool and months later they had seizure resistant brains. So he took a lab assistant of his who was a uh, medication uncontrolled epileptic having tens of seizures a month. They built a machine, trained her brain off and on over the next few years, she went off all her meds, remained seizure free for over a year. Oh my gosh, so wait, so is biofeedback and neurofeedback the same thing? All neurofeedback is biofeedback but some biofeedback is not on the brain or on the central nervous system. The central nervous system is anything encased by bone, like the spinal column and the brain, mostly. Okay, so, base, okay, so, what, so basically you're saying that neurofeedback can, could cure or... or re-regulate, Or re-regulate people who have epilepsy? Yeah, it, it suppresses seizures in the literature. Sturman published a metadata study in 2014, I think, or 2012, that show the average reduction of seizures is 50%, and 5% of people have complete control of seizures. Oh my God. But the okay. average reduction is 50%. Because there's a lot of other claims, right? So besides that, um, you claim, right, that yeah. neurofeedback could help with ADD. Yeah, that's our lowest hanging fruit is ADHD stuff. ADHD, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, sleep, stress, attention, sleep. anxiety, trauma, OCD, PTSD, developmental trauma. Okay, so I have a question. Chronic pain, immune systems. Let's start with ADD, because it's a very common, yeah. like you know, like sure. kids are always diagnosed with that. When Whenever someone is all over the place, they're like, they're like oh, I have ADD. I actually heard that ADD is not even a real thing. It's kind of a, a term that people slap yeah. on someone because yeah. they want to put, put a label yeah. on you. Sure, um, I think that's somewhat true. Okay. Um, I think that if you pathologize things, you should be careful not to call it a thing unless it's really getting in the way, right? Okay. Just what you said, right. if you don't like it, it's not a criteria for if it's a diagnosable problem. ADHD, unlike another problem, like a seizure disorder, is a, a specific illness. That's feature, right. And it can, right. There's many different types of them, but it's a dysregulation that's an illness, if you will, a, a cause. ADHD is a continuum of normal human attention. Some of us are hunters, some are gatherers. Right. Classic ADHD are stuck in this hunter mode and they can spot anything. You put the, the person who can't focus, the ADHD right. kid in a video game or a war zone or an intense fight and that person is more on than the average person. Right. It's not a, a deficit of their attention, it's a management of their attention. So you put them in a classroom and that hyper focus they found playing video games, they can't find in a boring boardroom or classroom. So it's, a, it's, rec it's relying on the environment. This hunter brain is relying mm -hmm. on the environment to cue you to notice what you have to do, to put you in a mode. Is, is, am I in tiger mode? Am I in pick the berry mode? Whatever it is. And ADHD is simply an inability to range yourself appropriately to inhibit, in, inhibitory focus and sustain focus and things like this. Pump the brakes, pump the gas. Okay, because ADD, I thought that, it sounds to me that ADD, or, or it seems like, I thought I had it, right? Because I can hyper focus on things that I really like. And the things that I'm not good at or I, I don't the like. the results of your test. Did you have ADHD? Right? No, no, that's what I find yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So, because I, I'm, we were just saying this off before we start, is that I feel like you, you know, there are, everybody is really good at some, at something, but not everything, right? Yeah. We all have our yeah. things that were, so, you know, I was kind of thought, my thought, what I thought it was, was that people who can hyper-focus on what they like and the stuff that they're not good at, they just can't, can't focus well, Most enough. people can though. 
But that's what I find it. But I even I labeled myself, even though it wasn't actually even true. Yeah. So, well, well, salience or interest will always drive up salience. So if you find things exciting, appetitive, sexy, dangerous, any high valence mm -hmm. will make us more on. ADHD or not, the problem is often AD, a classic boy ADHD types are impulsive will require the stimulus and they'll do things to create it. So they'll be disruptive in a classroom or an ADHD will, will fight with you and create conflict right. because now they're lit up and on right. in that conflict state. So yeah, it can be a thing, but it's a very small fraction probably of the people we call ADHD right. or ADD. You know, broadly it's now a behavioral kind of bucket, just like, you know, stress or whatever else. It's, and it's overdiagnosed, I think, yeah. I just find it interesting because like, to ha when you have a seizure, for example, that's like a real physical thing that you're actually going through versus- So is ADHD. Oh, for, but, yeah. or, or OC, but, but it doesn't seem, it's not as obvious, right? Like to, but it's, an, it's a, it's, yeah. when, when you have a seizure, it's very obvious. Right. Right? Well, ADHD is a set of trait resources, meaning it's how you're kind of tuned. A seizure is a failure of that stability of trait. ADHD is a type of trait. And OCD is also a failure of regulatory traits. Meaning you have a circuit that does something. It's, right. it's biased to do things in a certain way. And ADHD is just a certain bias. But OCD or seizures is a failure of the circuit to do what it should and get stuck in a certain way or the system to regulate properly. Okay, so how does it work? Break ADHD? it down. No, no, no. Break it down how neurofeedback works. Ah. Okay. So biofeedback on your brain waves or EEG biofeedback. So or someone will walk, like walk yeah. me through what happens basically. So neurofeedback on the brain waves, EEG biofeedback, is measuring your brain waves. So you come in, sit down, and we would put a couple ear clips on your ears and a wire on the spot, the spot of the brain we want to exercise. Mm -hmm. So there's a spot on the right, uh, in the middle of the motor cortex that is involved with supervisory attention, knowing if you're paying attention. Okay. So if you measure brain waves, if there's one spot compared to the earlobes, you end up getting a measurement of different brain waves changing under that electrode all on their own. Your brain's changing all by itself, right? Right. So there's a bunch of brain waves. Um, if we filter out of that signal off your head, a couple of brain waves called theta, which is between four to seven cycles per second, and beta, which in this case, let's call it like low teens, 12 to 15. If I measure the amount of theta and the amount of beta you're making moment to moment, these numbers are changing. High theta is distractible. High beta is focused. In fact, the ratio of theta to beta in kids is 94% accurate for spotting ADHD. It's a really very, tracks with executive function or self-control of what you're doing with your, with your attention. So if you want to be sharper, regardless if you have ADHD or not, you want to be more self-controlled, you measure that area involved with supervisory attention, you measure your theta and your beta. Whenever the theta happens to dip and the beta happens to go up on its own, you go, yay, to the brain with audio visual feedback. That was me, my treadmill. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. So when you're measuring the, uh, the things changing on their own, the brain's looking for stimulus. So you watch a computer screen and watch a spaceship fly or cars race. And whenever your brain happens to make a little more of this state you wanna exercise, you reward the brain with more audio and visual. Car drives faster, Pac-Man eats more dots, the music gets louder. And the next moment your brain does the wrong thing, the theta goes up and the beta drops and the car slows down. The Pac-Man stops eating dots, the music fades, and the brain happens to move in the right direction again, the software goes, yay, good job, brain. And the brain starts to notice, hey, wait a minute, when I drop my theta and raise my beta, stuff happens. I like stuff, stuff's cool. The trick here is we're moving the goalposts every few seconds, and only applauding trends in over a few seconds and minutes the brain's making. So wait, so, you cut, so people come in, yep. you, you stick some electrodes on their head, you yep. read their brain waves, yep. okay, right? And then, from how long does that how long does it well, take? Well, we start with a map of the brain. Okay. That's what you did with us. That's the full head cap. We right. squirt a full of gel. It's kind of annoying. It takes about half an hour. And you can't take. I mean, you're not allowed to have any stimulants like caffeine, coffee, caffeine. Adderall. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The the brain mapping or quantitative EEG is a measurement of your brain at rest compared to the average person your age, and the database of comparisons off of caffeine or Adderall, etc. So you have to be relatively clean, naive. Yeah, if you'll clean your brain in the morning. Measure at rest, big gross trait resources. How many of each brain wave? You know, where in the head? How fast are they? What are the distributions? Big gross things that don't change year to year. Your map today and your map in a year is the same, barring good data quality. So why was it when I, for me, when I went in there, 
uh, before I had the brain map done with the, with the cap and yeah. when they put the electrodes on, they gave me an attention test, right? Yes. That one, two, yes. one, two. And I did really shitty on that test. I couldn't focus on that. And yet my test of my brain still came back with no ADD. Yeah. So what was it then? Why couldn't I do that attention test, but yet I still did not have yeah. ADD? Well, what you, else could it be? It's, if it's, it's different what else aspects. is it for somebody? We have to pull up the test and look at it to break it down. Okay, but, 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 but you can be, it can be fatigue, it can be stress. I mean, people will score positive on ADHD tests with a concussion or with chronic anxiety throwing off your sleep or with PTSD if it's severe enough. You'll still get poor issues with executive function. And we tease apart all the resources. Plus, the attention test we have you do is the, is the most tedious, boring thing possible. Oh God, is it ever? It's terrible. Right? It's a yeah. one second challenge. You flash a number on the screen, a one or a two, or, or speak it over the speakers, and your job simply is to click the mouse for the ones and ignore the twos. <laughs> That's it. It was like one, two, one, two. But then you're saying, if you can't focus, if someone cannot focus, it's not necessarily because they have ADD. Right. They can have a whole other plethora Sleep issue, of anxiety, an auditory processing issue. And we tease it apart, auditory versus visual. We tease apart if it's just one of your resources or if it's short-term errors or errors over time. If it's errors in being careful or errors in being vigilant. And so you tease apart this. Also, we unload your attention. It's boring. You can't game it. It's one second of boring trial 440 times. That's what that is. It's wow. absurdly tedious. So you, you very rapidly stop being able to like game it with your intel intelligence. And you're performing at your worst. And we watch how you fall over. Is it vigilance? Is it impulsivity? Is it auditory? Is it visual? And that gives us a sense of how your performance uh, functions relative to people your age. And then we look at your brain in the same way. And those two things together give us a sense of what you might want to work on. Okay, so then you, you, you get the results of the test. Yes. Then we, you go, you go, you or someone else, this is a, we're, t we're just talking about the process of yeah. how it happens. Uh, go over the results. A couple then, days later, usually. Right, a couple yeah. days later. Um, and then from the findings, you tweak, you can tweak someone's brain technically. Yes. You can, not, I mean, yes. with, with actual machines. You can, you can teach brain. the brain how to change itself, largely, because with the way we do neurofeedback is we measure what your brain is doing, and when it happens to shift a little bit, we say, good job, and it learns how to shift itself a little more, and it's very iterative. You keep pushing it further and further. There are forms of neurofeedback that zap the brain with electricity and make it move more. So but, is it, it's, it's kind of sounds like uh, it's like positive reinforcement. It's exactly what it is. It's operant conditioning, which is reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah. That, so from those tests, then you go in and then you sit there. Three times a week for half an hour, put a couple ear clips on and one or two wires on top of your head measuring the circuits you may want to exercise. And that is your job. I mean, during the brain map discussion, it's not me saying, here's what's true for you. It's me teaching you how to read the data and say, here's how we think about data. Here's what it could mean. Here's what it often means. Right. And which of these things seem to be the big bottlenecks for you that you want to work on. And so I help you come up with an idea of the priorities, but they're your priorities. It's not a doctor patient. It's more of a coach client or athlete kind of relationship we have. And how long does it take? It takes half an hour for about three times a week and around three to five sessions in, you start feeling different and you notice wow, your sleep and yeah. your stress and your tension going subtly changed. And after three or four more sessions, you can often say what that's like. And we map the brain again and measure your attention again every 20 sessions. And we typically get more than a standard deviation of change in that chunk of time. If you had any room to improve, you're yeah. like ADHD or something, you have three to four standard deviations off if you're ADHD. Now, how much of this is psychosomatic? If you think it's going to work, it's going to work, right? Well, or it works on cats. Cats are pretty bad instruction <laughs> followers. It does, but actually. You know, it works right. on nonverbal children. It works on people in coma. I have plenty of nudie teen teenagers in my office who don't want to be there. It works whether or not you believe it. I have plenty of parents that do it. I don't believe in this stuff. I don't right. give my kids doing it. Wait a minute. I'm feeling incredible. So... How many sessions you th are you telling? You think that it needs? I think it needs altogether. a minimum of thirty for permanence. Usually forty for permanence. I like to do I like to do forty or fifty to start, and then my clients will typically do like fifty to one hundred is the range roughly. So of what, sessions. what do you say then for people like who are like shrinks like psychiatrists, yeah. people who go to therapy and spend you know whatever they're spending for years and years and years, and yeah. they're on meds for OCD, anxiety, yeah. ADD. Are you, like are you? 
really saying that that's all nonsense? No, People don't need to be no, on medication? No, I'm saying that for therapy, there's some things it's really a physiology issue. You should treat that. Like ADHD, you might have some life coaching or some scaffolding around your right. ADHD or the consequence of not having control of your attention, but you don't, you're never going to have therapy that gets rid of the impulsivity if you have ADHD, but you right. can very, very quickly, in a couple of months, eliminate the impulsivity in your brain, dramatically. Same with OCD, you, there may be still reasons for that anxiety disorder to have cropped up. OCD is a normal circuit in the front that gets kind of stuck, and PTSD, same thing in the back. You're going to still have the psychological import of those things, but neurofeedback can get the brain out of the way. Right. So the therapy, this is the relational thing, the psychological thing, the processing can now happen. I do think it gets, um, it, it can replace or eliminate many, many medications. So, then, but I, not therapy. But not, but no, but like people, maybe the ADD, I get that, but the anxiety, the depression, the sleep, mm -hmm. then if it, and I'm, and I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm just yeah, playing devil's yeah, advocate. Sure. If there's such a huge rate of people, basically almost you said 90% of people or so, who see results? Oh, it's, it's yeah. Or it's, even more, it's ninety five percent. It's up there. You said ninety five, I think. Uh, then why is not? Why isn't everybody t doing this? And everyone asked me that when they realized, especially right after they start feeling it kick in and go, "Oh my gosh, right. I have control over my brain." Why? Why didn't no one tell me this before? Right. Um, there's a bunch of reasons. One, it's expensive. It takes fifty sessions. And if you're a therapist in Los, I'm not a therapist, but if you're a therapist in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and you charge for three brain maps and fifty sessions, you're fifteen to twenty grand in. To a program in Los Angeles. And my big offices are in St. Louis, you're about 10 grand for a program. It's a lot of money to go through a process which is kind of like psychotherapy. So it's about, so in so basically in LA, how much would this whole thing for 50, 50 sessions would be Well, we charge 4500 for brain mapping and 50 plus sessions. But what my question but is Usually it's more like 15 or 20 grand in LA. Okay. And but, so say it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time, you know, would rather But so is therapy and so is everything else. Most of us would rather take the pill then do the work psychologically as well. Or we're walking on treadmills. Right. Most of us don't want to do this stuff, this lifestyle, lifestyle right. change things that take a, some time and take chipping away at. We want to just take the Lipitor or the, the blood pressure med or something instead of doing, you know, walking on one of these awesome the treadmills. The work, yeah. right? So that's interesting. So I, I've got a bunch of questions. First of all, so first of all, while we're even doing this, I do the podcast on the treadmills um, because I was, I believe, and I thought this is what all the research has proven yeah. that when you move, it helps with your cognitive functioning. Yeah, learning too, Spot, and, yeah. and learning. And so you do now that you're the you're the you're the expert. Would you say that's true? Learning certainly. Um, movement maybe depends. Some people are going to get some improved like uh, if uh, uh, verbal fluency and things by mm -hmm. moving. Other folks will just get a simple transfer of excitation meaning the physiological activation will turn into the cognitive activation and this will actually drive them in a way they're not used to. Really? Yeah, you're pretty, you, it's kind of like putting your, your, your guest at a disadvantage a little bit if not used to moving and talking. Really? Probably. Okay. It's, so, I, I, think it's, I think it's great. Keep no, doing it. Do, well, I get, um, my question is, do I, would I get better information from the guest then? More, more right? varnish. And more, I was going to yeah. say, probably more yeah, raw. more activated, so this is going to come because out a little bit. Because it's going to come up. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm going to keep doing it on the treadmill. Um, I'm okay. sure I'm louder and not as smooth on the treadmill than I would be sitting down, you know? Pro well, listen, what, I can, I'll go listen to one of your other podcasts that you've done, like Joe Rogan or whoever you've yeah. done, and then I'll, we'll compare. Um, okay, so then let's get back. So basically, you're saying that people can actually get off of medication if they actually for did sure, this yeah, properly. For, for, for things like attention stuff or sleep or anxiety, we have phenomenal results. All the things that all brains do. Right. Not disordered states per se. I'm not saying you're a cure disease state. I can't say that. But how about chemical? Like where does chemical imbalance come exist. in? No such thing. There's no such thing as chemical imbalances. No, doesn't exist. It's a theory that's never been borne out. And leave an example about why it's probably quite flawed. Um, you know about dopamine? Yes. The reward neurotransmitter. Yep. It's also dramatically involved with movement. The fact that we can do this is dopamine. Right, this is dopamine, what we're doing right now, okay. The biggest disorders of dopamine disorders are ADHD on the cognitive side mm -hmm. and Parkinson's. Actually, schizophrenia is also like a you know, dopamine right. thing. But Parkinson's, movement disorders, Parkinsonian things are uh, quite severe and come with them the cognitive aspects of dopamine as well, like attention problems. Mm -hmm. so, uh, all of your dopamine is built by a part of your brain called the substantia nigra of the pars compacta, the dense part of the black what? stuff. 
okay. pars compacta, dense part. It's the, the substantia nigra, the black stuff, deep in the brain. And then, like most parts of neurotransmitter production, they send the neurons out to the brain and deliver the neurotransmitters where they need to be in circuits. Neurotransmitters are not in circulation. They don't float through the brain looking for places to land. They're released right where they're used. So, mm. dopamine production deep in the basal ganglia, substantia nigra. You can lose 75 to 80% of your dopamine neurons before any Parkinson's symptoms show up whatsoever. Wow. Does that mean the first 75% of your dopamine systems are relevant? Absolutely not. It means the systems are really good at ranging themselves over any absolute level of signal by inserting more receptors, making receptors more sensitive, pulling receptors out. They can change, they can tune the sensitivity of the synapse itself. The absolute level of a, of a chemical are relevant. So I guess we could say also for pharmaceutical reasons, they, they, people take it because of the pharma business. But that's a misunderstanding of how it works. Take like SSRIs. We think, oh, I have a serotonin imbalance. Let me raise my serotonin, I'll be, not be depressed. But serotonin is not that involved in depression. It's involved with anxiety a little bit, sexual function a little bit. A lot About of what? Sexual function. Depression? No, no, serotonin. Oh, serotonin, okay. Um, yeah. As is, well, depression as well. Depression. Um, basically, serotonin is a gut neurotransmitter mostly. It's a little bit in the brain mostly involved with anxiety and a few other things. SSRIs mm -hmm. supposedly boost serotonin by getting rid of the reuptake molecule. They, they break the thing that cleans up serotonin out of the synapse, the reuptake inhibitor, SSRI. Mm -hmm. um, so as you take an, S an SSRI, theoretically serotonin builds up levels in the synapse. Except all serotonin neurons have autoreceptors to measure the amount of serotonin in the synapse they're releasing into. And if you take an SSRI and it starts to build up, the system downregulates. And a month and a half after starting an SSRI, you have lower serotonin in your brain than you did when you started. So depression has nothing to do with serotonin, it's about plasticity. Late, right, several steps plastic. down chain, the hippocampus gets plastic and makes you not depressed. So yeah, so what, I, what it sounds like that neurofeedback helps with the neuroplasticity of your brain. It does. It rewires your brain, it more does. or less. And there are, no, no, not more or less, more. More. It absolutely or, or, more. It, or, or just does that. And the studies, you know, a couple months ago showing a single session boosts plasticity broadly. There's, there's studies out from a couple of years ago showing you can see dramatic shifts in the brain's ability to rewire itself like that with neurofeedback. Now, how about if you do have to do the sessions all within a certain period, like within, if you just do one, let's say, and come, come back like two weeks and do another. Not much will happen. Nothing. So you need to, it has to be, it has to be a routine and a regimen, kind of like anything else. Like you have to practice it. You've got to do repetition, basically. It's like building your resources. You right. have to keep building them until they're where you want them to be. Or for fit, it, it's like fitness for it your is, body. It is. The, 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 the metaphor breaks down a little bit because the brain is a regulatory machine more than a strength machine and it tends to get itself into a new pattern and hang out there. So once your brain learns to control mm -hmm. your attention, suppress seizures, turn sleep on and off appropriately, not freak out about anxiety states, once you build enough of the resource regulation, it takes over and it remains stable. So the metaphor is kind of like having a bad knee. Mm -hmm. You go to a PT or an OT for a few months, get really strong knees, and now you have part of your routine is doing some woodway treadmill every, you know, three times a week. <laughs> woodway treadmill. You know, you end, you end up keeping that nice regulatory resource strong. Right. But if your routine is sitting on the couch, watching TV seven days a week, the knee might fall apart. That's interesting. So basically, if, so for more for fitness stuff or physical, you, got, you have to keep it at maintain it or you lose it. But the brain, for you your, don't. But for your brain, yeah. once it's kind of reprogrammed, it's reprogrammed. Yeah, and, and to the same extent, if you did a month of training and took uh, stop training completely, neurofeedback, right. it would wear off subjectively, but one session back lifts everything right back up because the brain remembers much better than the body does. You have to rebuild the muscle fibers or anything. Just the, the learning is still there to be reactivated. So I, I'm still confused if, if, if it's something that you yeah. do 30 times or 50 times, yeah. let's just say whatever the number is, 30, 40, 50, okay? That's still way less yeah. time than you going to see a shrink. Because I know people, I have friends who go twice a week, once a week for the last 20 years yeah. of their life. Yeah. So that's still time. There's a few time. other reasons why it hasn't gotten good penetration. Um, one of the reasons is no one owns it. So okay. you can't get insurance reimbursement for it. You can't do big studies. You know, you have to spend about $5 million to an FDA level study for re insurance reimbursement. No one owns it, so no one's putting the money in to the money back. You also couldn't blind, do placebo-controlled, double-blind neurofeedback on EEG until very recently. 
I did a placebo-controlled double-blind experiment for my grad dissertation at UCLA mm -hmm. on neurofeedback and showed how the brain's responding to the event of the reward beep in real time and not in a sham case. But that was one of the first studies ever done with a sham placebo and neurofeedback. And that was in like 2010 when I did the research or something. And so this is just barely, now there's a lot of multi-center studies going on, but it's been hard to do sham. The process, as you'll discover, is heavily individualized. How do you test 50 people when your goals for fitness and performance are different than the next person over? I'm not right. testing exercise. I'm testing like this technique and that technique and how it tunes. It's very different. It's not one thing. It's, it's a whole nuanced suite of tools and approaches that have to be tuned to each individual and might be very, very different approaches, one person to the next based on what your goals are. You know, I, I find I have a good friend of mine who's a child psychiatrist, and he's actually also one of the leading ones in the in the country, or at least I think so, right? And he's I, I've told him all about this, about you know, I was so excited and that. Yeah. And there are naysayers out there. Sure. Because, you know, he claims that there really hasn't been any real research to say like definitively, this yeah, actually the, works. Well, that's or not, is it because he's a shrink and he's going to say that? It's both. The research is weak. But in 2012, the American Academy of Pediatricians raised neurofeedback up to level one best support for ADHD. The same as, the same as Adderall. Then why are they not as, why, as insurance or why isn't insurance covering it? Because the research is weak, weaker than it is for medication. Again, heavily individualized work. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of papers out there, but they're all small N or small, small numbers of people, weak effects. And yet, I challenge your psychiatrist friend to come to my office, get a brain map, I'll mm -hmm. tell him things cold by himself that I shouldn't be able to know, mm -hmm. and then do a month and a half of training with me and I will change his performance in a way he feels and I can measure. Well, yeah, and also, the truth of the matter is a lot of high performance athletes, like Olymp Olympians, high performance uh, yeah. business NFL people, people, NFL, a lot of sport, a yeah. lot of athletes, Olympians. I'm working with David Nurse, who's an F NBA shooting coach. I mean, you know. these, oh, David, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, David? No, I know, I know, do you know Drew ha Hanlon? Is that his name? I know his name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was on the podcast. Yeah. I mean, oh, great. yeah, a lot of these people who are um, like super high at their, and they're like looking for any advantage, right? Even like CEOs yeah. or people who are yeah. like huge, you know, huge business. About a third of my clientele are these extreme performers, the, the Olympic athletes, you know, Brian McKenzie and you know, those right. sorts of folks, Ben Greenfield, all those guys yeah. who are seriously squeezing every little bit of performance out of life. Is that biohacking? Oh, those are all biohackers. Exactly. So, the, yeah. the, those are like the, I, I consider, don't tell Brian I said this, he'll hate me, but I consider <laughs> Brian and Ben kind of like the fitness model version of yeah. like athletes. Like right. they're, you know, they're doing amazing biohacking stuff, but they're also about looking amazing on a cover of a magazine, these yes. guys, you know, and, and, be, and living that lifestyle. And does it work for that because it's, it tweaks your it does. brain? Helps you he heal more deeply. You can raise growth hormone. How? You, you can do, how I don't know. It, it, how can it raise growth hormone? Better sleep. Pretty so, deep sleep. Okay, you so heal for, faster. The sleep, for, the, for the sleep reason. Yeah. Mm. Or these guys, you know, who are performance driven, you know, on the starting line, a little yeah. bit impulsive, you can relax more deeply, you can act more rapidly. That's what SMR is. The reason Sturman shows this frequency in cats to train up is because cats, predators, make a lot of this frequency. If wow. you've seen a cat yeah. on, on a windowsill watching birds, it's liquid body and laser like focus. That's a motorically, physically inhibited state because you can leap into action much faster from relaxation than you can from tension. So Sturman saw it in a predator and has trained it up. It turns out that high SMR state, high uh, low beta state, is motorically still, mentally active. It's the opposite of ADHD. So when you train up SMR in humans, you not only make the brain seizure resistant, like in Sturman's grad student. Your vocabulary, I'm trying to like, it's hard to concentrate on your vocabulary and walk on this treadmill, I'll tell you that much. Ah, see what I'm saying? <laughs> putting people at a disadvantage. Right, you have actually. Um, I gotta hold on here to make sure I'm, I'm not gonna fall. So, but yes, we can often make really quite a, a large difference in big things, but the literature is not there yet. The biggest reason is it's an individualized process. It's so, hard to test that way. It is hard to test that way. So then it's basically, if anyone has a kryptonite, this is, if you have this, if you have that, it's kind of like you're saying that it's like the heal, it, it can heal anything. It can heal autism, it can help with autism, well, it, it can, can help it with seizures. It can work seizures. on the system of your brain right. and improve your stress response, your sensory integration, your attention, your sleep your mood, um, and then if there's specific things the that are The OCD, off, let's do like, let's talk about OCD, great. right? How does it help with OCD? So OCD often, 
most of the time is a failure of a failure of this little circuit in the front called the anterior cingulate. You have cingulate cortex. Talk in like in, in yeah. Like well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the anatomy and I'll break down what it does. Okay. So you have two cingulate cortices, cortices, one in the front, one in the back, called the anterior and the posterior cingulate. They're part of something called the default mode network, which pays attention to yourself. If your mind's drifting, you're thinking about your life, you're in that default mode network mode, mm -hmm. your reverie. It's a very active part of the way the brain can be. But there's two circuits involved in it, the cingulates, whose job it is to decide essentially how you manage your attention. The anterior, the front cingulate's job is to decide what you focus on, what's important to think about or to attend to. The posterior cingulate's job is to decide what's necessary around you. So if you left the house and you weren't sure if you turned off the fireplace or the heater or whatever, mm -hmm. you're thinking about it and kind of stuck on it, or if there's a song in your head all day long, that's the anterior cingulate running itself at kind of a hot speed. If you bite your nails or if you're OCD, it's the selection of attention getting stuck. So if I looked at your brain at rest, we would see a big blob of beta waves usually, two, three standard deviations higher than average compared to the average person your age. Usually it's beta, too much gas pedal. Occasionally it's too much theta, which is like too little braking, but a very similar phenomena subjectively. And I would say, oh, for some people, this little blob of beta on the front midline is a perseverative feature. You get stuck on things, you bite your nails, songs in your head, a little OCD, oh, you are. This is probably related. This is a hot cingulate compared to average. I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but it's more active than average. Let's see what happens if we exercise it down. And you would go, I felt my brain unclench. I, I, I could put down the thing I was stuck on. I would keep people giggling. I'm like, what's going on? I can't find my OCD right now. I'm reaching for it, it's not there, instead of pushing away all day long. So, okay, so like then, kind of like emotional eating or over or being overweight, weight loss, mm -hmm. is that kind of also um, when you overeat, right? Yeah. An OCD, right? Because yeah. you're fixating on the food and or? Eating, eating's subtle, eating's complex. Eating's very complex, because you can, you can be doing it for a lot of different reasons. But what I'm trying to get at is, does it help with weight loss? It does. Because you're for, tweaking your brain. I don't care why you have problems eating. If it's right. social stuff, if it's anxiety, if it's impulsivity, if it's obsession, it'll help. It might be dysregulated body image. Mm -hmm. It's not about your brain. Right, right, right. And then I'll get your brain out of the way. The impulsivity, the anxiety, the sleep issues, whatever else out of the way. You're your therapist and you can work on your eating disorder. But what, what I'm trying to get at is, do you actually, would you say you still need a therapist for this, for that part? Or are you Depends. saying, you know, if you have a weight, if you're, if you need, if you have um, a weight issue or you're trying to have weight loss or whatever the reason is, would you say that neurofeedback can help you with the weight loss versus, you know, um, you're, you're talking about having an eating disorder. It's a little I'm bit I'm talking different. about having any yeah. reason your brain doesn't do what you want. And that can be anxiety or impulsivity. I mean, I eat too much when I eat. I eat too much too. sometimes. And I obsess and, about it. And I don't obsess about it. No, I obsess I about the food, like at your, at your office. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's so, right. So let's just say, so um, before Dr. Andrew was um, this cognitive neuroscientist, uh, he was a baker. I was. And when I went to his office to get my brain map, and, and believe me, when I, went to get, when I went to get my brain map, he made, just by coincidence, not for me, but for yeah. the office, these amazing blueberry pumpkin muffins. And yeah. how many did I eat, like eight? I think you ate like two. But, but you might have taken two home with you. No, something. I had like eight. Okay. Ask your, ask the guys who were there. It's great. And I, and I was great. fixating on. I'm like every time I had one, I was like, okay, I want another one. Okay, I, and I wouldn't let my brain relax Ooh. until I had the next one. The next and so I, I forget if you're into your single. It happens a lot. Does it? Yeah. Well, I, I actually, did we see a little singular activation for you? I forget. I think I don't. I think we might I, have. I think a little bit. Yeah. 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 But like, it's not this diagnostic process. I was like, oh, OCD. Oh, you get fixated. I go, oh, for some people. This might be relevant, and you're like, oh yeah, like those muffins, right? And, and I'm like, yep, yeah, okay, this is relevant then. And the next question becomes: Now that you understand your brain, would you like to change this feature or right. not? It's not about doctor patient. I'm never going to say to you, I'm sorry, ma'am. Here's what's wrong with you. It's always like, does this performance data match your goals or performance hitch? Right. It does. Great. We only ever get excited when we see real things, right? Even if they're things that you're suffering with, we're only ever happy if they're actually big, clear features in the data because then we can change them. So right, so basically it's up to the person to figure out if it's an issue for them. And if they feel it's an issue, yeah. then it's workable. If not, yeah. it doesn't matter what you see or what you think or whatever else, yeah. because then they're not gonna even take action. And, and because I am looking for you to say to me a few weeks or months from now, oh, I got some progress in these things I care about. 
And so this is also why I measure your attention in the attention test, because that's a valid, straightforward read of your performance. Okay. So you can say, I want to be more focused. I'm not focused. I can go, oh yeah. Or you're focusing fine, but your auditory processing is off. Let's work on that and you'll feel your focus improve. Right. So I use the data to interpret almost what you're asking me or labels you come in with, diagnos diagnostic labels you come in with. I'm dropping below that going, wait, what does this person actually want? What are they talking about? Which resource in the brain are they really talking about? Not, not anxiety, but cingulate, not depression, but asymmetry, not, you know. Well, how about stuff like just, how about stuff like, can you raise your IQ? By, taking, by doing neurofeedback? I've never measured it, but the literature shows, there's a few papers that show a good standard deviation of improvement. I usually improve alpha speed of processing uh, measures quite a lot doing neurofeedback, and those are highly correlated with anxiety. Yeah, but I've never measured anxiety. I don't believe in, I don't believe- Oh, um, you never measured anxiety? Sorry, uh, ten, uh, intelligence. Intelligence. I don't, I don't believe intelligence tests are valid, largely. Intelligence tests are what, intel, uh, you know, intelligence is what intelligence tests measure. It's a very circular definition. And they've been historically used kind of in a weird way. They were started mostly in this state in California mm -hmm. as a measure, measure of chronological versus developmental age. I, are, you physically, are you physiologically slow? Right, right, And right. then they've been great changed every couple of years, but I don't think they're an especially valid test. If you go into sub aspects of those tests, like working memory or speed of processing, you get into things that are actually core human things. There's a third one now in literature called implicit learning. Those are the big three. Speed of processing, working memory, and implicit learning. That's all that's valid. IQ, it's kind of a squirrely concept. Right, so the overall umbrella of IQ doesn't really make sense, but, but you can help with the memory and, the, and your speed of cognition. But there are papers that show comprehension. good 15 point increases and more 20 point increases on IQ on tests. So when executives come to you, like we we're talking, what's their yeah. main thing that they're trying to fix or help? Yeah, you know, most of them come with this perspective of nothing's really wrong or they just want to squeeze a little more performance out. And invariably, I, I joke that, that that OCD marker, yeah. I also joke it's the CEO marker. Really? Because it's not a problem per se. If right. you're using that singular to hyperfocus and organize your mind, great. If it's using you, it's OCD. But if you're using that resource in an extra strong way, it's unusual, but maybe it's fine. So most of these people, men and women, will have this little anterior singular hotspot. Some of them also have things like can't settle down at night after powering through their day or they have some anxiety about all the different you know, business things they have to think about. Or, you know, so it's just classic stuff, sleep issues, anxiety, sometimes they're drinking too much, you know, or using too much Coke. Right, or right. Also, or, you know, having a little lifestyle. Well, that's of course. But, okay, so you're, so would you say you've seen a lot of, what's the, what have you seen the most, like as a correlation, like people who are super successful in business yeah. usually have Usually have some anxiety. Anxiety. Because, because until, OCD, it sounds like you said OCD. Yeah, but that's a form of anxiety. Okay, so OCD is a form of anxiety. Yeah, okay. yeah it really is. I mean, and I see, you, you, what you see in driven people is, is generally some anxiety. You also see intelligent people. Right, anxiety. You know, your brain, if you have all these extra resources, you have extra resources with which to catastrophize. Anxiety in what? That's, very, that's a big, broad statement, right? I, and I think about, again, below the label, okay. what are the circuits? So I think about the anterior circuit for perseveration, getting stuck. Okay. The, Posterior cingulate is doing this thing where it's evaluating what's happening around you and looking for danger. So if you drop your phone, you're kind of fishing around for it when you're driving. Not that she would do this. Right, right, But right. if you did, there's a sense of, oh, watch the road. And that's coming from the posterior cingulate throwing a flag in the play. And so you've helped people who are executives get to the next, like kind of like level up, yeah. whatever you want to say, with their anxiety or it was- or Yeah, and be more productive in their jobs and be less of a jerk to their subordinates or get home and not yell at their kids. But they're usually productive, not mm -hmm. always, of course, is but usually they're usually are. really yeah. successful, yeah. you're productive, but I say it's also like, you're hyper-focused in one area of your life because you're good at it and you like it yeah. and that's where yeah. you put all your attention. Also, these people often aren't smoothly productive. What does that mean, smoothly? You know, you, they're often at the same level of output and productivity and decision making at 10 a.m. as they are at 4 p.m. Oh, okay. There's a lot so, of variability, a lot of powering through high powered structured day in the way that makes the best for them and then burn out all at once or get home and like yell at your kids or, you know, there's this is like changing gears thing. It's very hard for some of these high performers. It's kind of what you're saying. They yeah, hyper specialize, exactly. hyper activate. And they're super good in one area of their life. They're, and I, I mean, I see this all the time with my with with this podcast and otherwise in my in my day to day life, that it's about having you know not to habits and the hustle, right? Like people put 
very uh, specific habits and rituals in their life to kind of be as successful and productive as possible. So you're saying once they use up that time, that's when like they're, they're off the rails, basically. Well, it's, it's also resources. I mean, there's decision fatigue. If you're making important decisions all day long, it's hard to keep making decisions at home. And then there's, right. there's stamina and there's like just actual fatigue. I mean, anxiety is quite common. The most common thing are sleep issues. And that's not just executives and high powered you know, performers. Most people, I look at your brain and I'm like, uh, you're not sleeping that well. But how about actual, I know you're big in the sleep situation. It's like, foundational. Yeah. And, and, well, and it's, it's, it's not just the amount of sleep, it's circadian regulation. It's getting into good quality sleep when you're sleeping. It's But sleep has, has been huge for a long time about the important, I mean, how yeah. powerful and important sleep is, right? But I can change it rapidly within a few weeks. And Often these chronic alcoholics, they're shaky and nervous and can't fall asleep without a drink. Two weeks in their feedback, they can turn their brain off and fall asleep at will. Can it help with addiction then? Can it help Hugely. with alcohol? So yeah. Hugely. So it can help with food addiction. It can help with yeah. alcohol. That's what I was trying to get at Hugely. before. Yeah, Doug Quirk did some work years ago showing that, um, oh sorry, Peniston, Eugene Peniston did some work showing that the recidivism rate of alcoholism is reversed. It goes from three quarters down to one quarter, from two thirds down to one third. Uh, the relapse rate for alcohol. It's a huge impact in alcohol. So I just don't, I mean, I keep on repeating this, but it feels like it's, you're saying that this neurofeedback is like the panacea of everything. Why? Well, it has lots of tools in it that it can do lots. Lot of, yeah. Does yeah. it matter? What, is there different kinds? Because you're not, yeah, I mean, there, there you're not the only one, right? There's other people, like you were saying, other institutes that yeah, do it. What's the difference? Thought. So there's about 5,000 people in the U.S. that do this, and about 10,000 worldwide. But half of them do it the way that I do it, maybe more. And that's using brain mapping or QEEG as a diagnostic and sort of the you know, lens to understand you and then come up with some, some ways right. to move your brain. Um, the other half are one size fits all tools or tools that have more marketing than science built into them or tools focused at consumers. And yeah, it matters. And then there's some other you know, next generation things that are much more uh, uh, aggressive that you zap your brain with electricity or do you know all kinds of you know all the sites at once in your head or something none of these are any better they all work okay but any good clinician any good neurofeedback coach can make progress with any tool the problem you have is some clinicians only know their magic box tools and don't know science around it and mm -hmm. so something happens if you're not average they won't get good results so I'm not a big fan of one size fits all approaches for fitness at all. And that's what this is. Right. You know, you're the guy who wheezes up the one stair to the gym or you're Laird Hamilton walking in and you both want better abs, different plan. <laughs> you can both have better abs. It's a very different plan. Right. You know, right, for right. Laird's like, okay, we'll cut off that, you know, a little bit of carb and do a little IF. And for the guy that's 300 pounds overweight and wheezes up one step, it's like, let's have a discussion about whole body exercise right. and managing your sleep and not eating at night for insulin resistance first. Right. And no, you know, different, different things are important. So right. it's very variable. And, and unfortunately that then requires someone like me in the mix who can go, oh, you have these goals and this brain? Ah, right, so I should take these someone, approaches. So you need to be able to have someone who can read it well as well and know, yeah. Okay. And who knows the process, who can change gears if you have effects that they don't expect, who can bring new tools to bear. Yeah, it's personal training essentially. For your brain. For your brain. So. Let me ask you this. Let's get away from neurofeedback for a second, right? Since you are a brain guy, brain doctor-ish. Um, what are other tools people can do if they don't have like a neurofeedback place yeah. or they don't want to do it? How about stuff like meditation? Meditation is uh, huge. Right? Yeah. Like stuff like that to kind of calm your brain or tweak your brain. Yeah. Does that work? Those, those things Meditation, work? it works very, very well. Um, meditation is an act of executive function training. And it doesn't, um, for folks that haven't meditated, the act of meditation may not be calming. You're, it, I can't do it. I've, I've tried multiple times. But, the, but people often think that it's, that doing meditation is a, a process of clearing your mind, and it's not. It's a process of anchoring your mind or focusing your mind onto something. So to paraphrase, uh, I think John Kabat-Zinn, uh, meditation is paying attention mm -hmm. in a particular way on purpose, to the present moment, and I would add replacing sort of judgment with like a curiosity, like, a, like an investigation sense. Ooh, what's happening now? Right. Instead of like, ah, oh, I'm not doing it right. But what happens is if you anchor to something, be it the breath crossing the lip or your chest rising and falling or traffic coming and going outside, 
since you have a mind, within moments of anchoring, you think about you're hungry, your knee hurts, that guy's cute, whatever, and you get distracted within moments because you have a brain. That's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> what, you yes. go, what you do is go, oh, wait a minute, I'm not meditating right now. Go back to the anchor. You've just done a meditation. That is a rep. Great, keep doing it. Hold your attention onto the anchor, whatever anchor you've chosen for that meditation. As soon as you're distracted, let it go, not now, back to the, back to the anchor. Again and again and again. That repetition. Will... It's repetition, but anything But though. it's repetition of focus, not of peacefulness or quietude. The type of focus changes based on the type of meditation. Right. So the present time, which is uh, Vipassana. Single point, which is Samatha or concentration practice. Do you meditate? I do. And so do you think it's a good tool though? I do, a right. huge tool. And you're carrying around the equipment to do it all the time, so. Right, you could do it whenever. Might so, as well. And I, I, like it sounds like with all of this, it's getting into like, it's just changing habits. the pattern and habits, habits. all habits. Yeah, and I have a different view on habits than most people. Okay, My, this uh, is, most okay, scientists yeah. will say, if you look, look at the habit literature, they'll say, it's like a three week, four week process. Coaches say that anyways. Mm -hmm. Neuroscientists generally have a bit of an open-ended answer to things. But um, my take on habits is five weeks because there's many time courses of learning in the brain. There's a time course which is minutes long. If you did a single neurofeedback session today or even nothing high tech, a piano lesson today. Mm -hmm. If you don't already play piano, the end of the day today, every single hand area in your brain Every single hand cell would have moved around talking to different cells. Every single one within hours. Cells can be organized. Mm -hmm. And then you have new cells being born all the time. It takes five weeks for those cells to go from pluripotent sort of neural stem cells mm -hmm. into the kind of cell they're going to be. They travel throughout the brain, following messages. Half of them never make it anywhere and get resorbed. The other half turn into the kind of cell they're going to be, make friends, make networks, set up shop. So there's a learning course from like a few minutes to about five weeks. So you're saying five weeks. So you're, t you're basically upping it by like two weeks or a week. I'm saying that you should keep doing stuff because now you've literally built new physical new. tissue, not just tuned the existing tissue into new shapes, which is new tissue. Got it. Like so added new cells. So when all these coaches and people are like, oh, it takes three weeks to, you know, to, to create a new habit, you're saying actually to tune what you have, but if you want to actually grow or have yeah, yeah. Okay. add new and tissue add, and add new tissue yeah it's five new weeks. cells it's five weeks if they're being incorporated into, into, yeah. new, into new habits i totally believe that i totally I, what else? and i've seen them some things for three and a half weeks and then fallen off the wagon have you or four weeks many many times and you know it's also like i have great intentions of doing it and then of course yeah. you know i think everyone also has just they don't will i think willpower is a muscle that gets flex too much and then it dies right like you can't yeah. you know what i mean like so you have to learn other things to other not tricks other too. tricks right yeah. to not do something to do something what do you think about putting things on like on autopilot as much as you can like wearing the same thing every day for yeah. example so you don't use your yes. brain power yeah, steve for, jobs wearing his black right. turtleneck so you know, decision fatigue for exactly. the things that mattered um it's great i also think that life is wonderful and varied and you should you know stop and smell the different colored turtlenecks Right. You know? Uh, what? Stop and smell the different color, colored turtlenecks. Oh, turtlenecks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yes, I got um, you. I got you. Yeah, sure. But, I mean, very few of us have that many demands on our life that we can't decide what to wear. No, but you the know? idea behind it is that you uh, are not putting brain power into something that's not really that important yeah, in, but in, in also, the grand scheme of things. And you can, folk, yes, you can take that percentage into something else. Maybe. But also you're developing the habit of not being mindful and aware and present in your things you do willfully and voluntarily. I mean, do you, do you have the same meal every day and don't think about it when you're done eating? Or do you sit and savor the bites? Do you drive to work and brown out on the way there because it's the same route? Or do you discover the new artwork on the wall next to you? I but, mean, that, but then that, this is a whole conversation about why then build healthy, positive habits because people need structure, right? So for me, when I build my habits and a lot of other people, yeah. obviously, it's because they need some kind of structure to keep them on point yeah. so, they don't, so, they, so they don't sway into something that would be bad for them. But I think it's about balancing like the reward value and the appetitive, interesting yumminess of things and the, 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 the quick rewards against, I mean, we as humans have all these competing things, right? Mm -hmm. We're able to delay gratification, think about abstracts, and it's that kind of stuff versus but eating all the don't. sugar. But we don't. A lot of us don't have it that well, right? That's why we put these, it's, these 
the structure and regiment. Yeah. yeah. But it's all. But it is a balance. Even those of us who aren't doing everything right are probably still mostly getting up and going to work. Let's say, you know, we're adhering to structure. Right. You know, and there's always. And this is always a moving target. I, 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 I love with habits. When, when coaching people about things to implement, to really, you know, I really try to work right up to the point of telling people what to do and then not tell them what to do because I want people to def- discover what works for them mm-hmm. and to use a habit as, a, as a, a workbench in a lab to play with something, see what works, refine it and learn from it. And I, I think of a, of, a, of, a, of a habit really more of a practice unless it's something you're doing to maintain health. Like if, if you have a workout you do all the time, now it's a habit or you go, go to groceries, but. I, also, I often think about these things, like for me, I have a hard time sticking with yoga every single day, all the time, mm-hmm. and I come and go, I travel, it's, you know, I get injured, it's hard. And I, and I used to think, oh, I gotta get my workout in. Willpower was failing. Right. But I, I saw, um, who was it, Keenan McGregor talked about Ashtanga Yoga and, and, and doing yoga as a devotion. You mean Con, you know, the UFC guy? Con, no, no, uh, Kino, she's a woman. Oh, okay. Uh, talked about Akino McGregor. Uh, she's a Ashtanga, a oh, Ashtanga oh, oh. yogi teacher. That's why I'm not um, a yoga person. And she talked about it being more of a devotion and approaching your daily practice like a devotion instead of a workout. Mm. And that resonated with me. And so for the next two, three months, I was like, well, it's not about getting my workout in and therefore I don't have time, it's not worth doing. Or if right. I'm not feeling it's not worth doing, it's, well, here's what I'm doing today because this is my practice time. So yeah, it was a habit. But the habit was a practice of sitting with how I was feeling and doing whatever, doing it regardless of how I was feeling, and less about what I was doing automatically. It wasn't running through my hour-long practice. It was, now I have time, let me do some practice. But within that moment, I was being very mindful and very intentional, listening to my body. And I think if you put too much stuff on autopilot, you might not, you might miss things. I get you, you know, but how about all these CEOs have things on autopilot? They're coming with heart problems and anxiety and sleep issues because they aren't taking care of the things that are less important, you know. Than but a lot of these people who I deal with, right, talk to, their situation is they wake up. Most of these, I, I wake up at four a.m. and I do yeah. this and I do that, and yeah. then by they're basically done like a whole f- week yeah. of stuff. But by the time it's like sure. seven a.m. in the morning. And they do that because they have so much other stuff to do. They want to make sure yeah. that stuff is out of the I, way. And I do that. And it, right. So yeah. what do you, so you do that too? Yeah, I get up at 4 a.m. Okay, so what do you do? Uh, I spend an hour relaxing, have some coffee. Well, you wake up at 4 a.m. to relax? Yeah. So why don't you just sleep for another hour? Because I'm not relaxing. Okay, but sleep is really important too. Yeah, but I get plenty of sleep. Okay, what time do you go to bed? About nine. Okay. Yeah. All right, so you wake up at four, four to relax. To relax, have some coffee, check anything urgent that I, that I need to check the night before. Okay. Um, then I do yoga, about five, 5.30, for about an hour. Okay. And then my company's waking up about 6 a.m. California time. Okay. Uh, throughout the world, so I'm starting to have to answer questions. And from six to about noon, I'm doing lots of stuff. And then I change gears and do more consults and things in the afternoon. So really your only real habit is doing that yoga at five o'clock and waking up at four. Yeah. 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 Is there food? What do you have? Like, do you have other things besides meditation that Which is now part of my yoga because the yoga I do is a moving meditation type yoga. It's got a vinyasa flow. It's called Ashtanga. So you you, you repeat the same, the same practice all the time, directed gaze, repetitive breath. So I used to meditate, do yoga, work out all separately, but now they're all kind of the same thing. So for me, it's a function stacking, you know, kind of thing to like do several mm-hmm. things at once in the same place. And I get my meditation, my workout, you know, my, my practice in that way. So yoga, do you, so do you think yoga really helps with your brain too? I do. And breath yeah. work, you said yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, I think, I feel like breath work has really become big recently. Yeah. I know it's been around forever, obviously, but yes. now there's much more, yeah. uh, we're more aware attention of, of, on of, of how much control we have. I mean, we're, we're discovering. You know, the, the things that seem sexiest to me in neuroscience are discovering there are these levers that are built in for control, you know, to controlling how we feel. And, mm-hmm. and meditation's in that category. But then there's lots of this new breathwork stuff, you know, talking about how we actually have control over states, recovery, habits. Um, and of course, Brian McKenzie, people like that are really pushing that, you know, skill set. Then Andrew Huberman up in uh, NorCal is talking about how things like gaze direction will change your activation level, how you slice up time and perceive stress. What's gaze direction? Literally, if you're looking up and away, your gaze is uh, not converging. If you're looking down in front of you, your gaze is converging. So you've experienced a lot of classic stress, you know, anxiety, and your brain is looking down in front of you, your eyes are slicing, your, your eyes are together, so your brain is slicing up time very rapidly to process information right around you because you may have to touch things. 
So where the, what, is he, what do you say for gaze? You look up and look away, uh -huh. your brain will drop down to a slower time processing, and you'll calm right down, involuntarily, in a way that's built in, in a, in a way that breath work is not necessarily to do something for breath work or for meditation. I don't think meditation should be an intervention for stress. Mm -hmm. Breath work might be. What if someone can't do breath work or meditation because their brain can't slow down Gaze enough. direction. So then I think that's what I was You look say, up and you look away brain. at a vista and your brain will slow down. I like that. Gaze direction. How long should you be doing that for? Try it. It's almost instantaneous. If you're, if you're stressed, your mind's like going a mile a minute, it is almost instantaneous. Okay. It is a built-in lever from the time you're born. I like there. that one because... I'm gonna try. I'm just doing it right now as we're talking. It works best in like like looking at like big the vista. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, not yeah. looking at my at my door behind right, you. Right, you know. Right. I mean, what looks like a 4K TV, you know, like the ocean crashing yeah. or the Grand Canyon, but it's that whole like my eyes are looking far away. I mean, think about it. Evolutionarily, if you're looking far away, you're traveling. You're on a horse. You're on a river. You're walking. You don't care what's right in front of you. Right. But if you're looking down right in front of you, you may have to re react very rapidly, and that produces a different type of brain activity. That's a good one. So. Tell me another one that would be great for your brain, to train your brain. Meditation is the, really the biggest one. I know, we, uh, went, we went through meditation, yeah. we went through breath work, gaze, it's called gaze direction. Gaze direction, changing the direction, gaze direction. Gaze, yeah, yeah. I have two more I wanna ask you about. What's, how about the sensory deprivation tank? Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Or more and more people are getting to, more and more people are doing it. Yeah. And when you have no, you're not using your other sensors, your brain has to focus more, right? Or, well, or, it, or, it or train creates, your brain, or train your brain. It creates information out of the chaos of nothingness, basically. So you actually hallucinate and have internal experiences. I consider float tanks to be a version of like a shamanic experience, basically. Like shamanic experiences push your ordinary consciousness far enough that you have a slight shift in consciousness and come back to ground later with a little different perspective. That's what shamanism is. Mm -hmm. It's ecstatic technique, changing ordinary consciousness, coming back with transformation. That's what a float tank is. It also can cause deep relaxation responses, hypnogogic state change, which is the same thing that re-regulates those alcoholics I talked about in neurofeedback, the deep ability to relax. So you can do some stuff there. But I don't think float tanks are all that exciting. They're an interesting tool, you know, like, a, like an exploration tool. But for me, there's other things that are, you know, much higher up the list. Can it also create anxiety? Because Absolutely. you're like in this water and you're by yourself and dark is black Absolutely. as hell, right? You should not do sense depth stuff if you have a trauma history, if you have a lot of anxiety. You shouldn't do meditation with a lot of anxiety. You should get rid of anxiety first and then meditate or meditate as a way of reducing tone over time, but not as a way, not an intervention against things. Well, I'm glad that you said that because, you know, again, the meditation is like a panacea too of anybody who, yeah. for anybody to kind of quiet or train or focus their brain. So then if that's the case, if you have, an, if you have, an anxi if you have anxiety, you could do gaze direction. What else can you do? You said there's all these things above sensory deprivation tanks. So give yeah. me yeah for me, anxiety um, or or yeah, yeah for any of these for for your brain. I mean, for your brain in general, uh, sleep hacking is up is number one. Meditation is right up there. And nutrition, which is a mix of how you eat and and, and, and what you eat. I was going to ask you, do you have foods that you think really do help? with brain power? Yeah, generally the rules are- Besides like the ones that everybody knows. Well, I mean, the, that's the thing. This is a very personal topic. You, I'm asking you, it's personal. You're on I, my, it's I, you. I'm, I'm a gerontologist. I really view you should minimize sugars and starches to near zero in your, in your life over time. But that's, you made those That's muffins. my biggest rule. <laughs> yeah, because it's not rigid, not orthorexic. I'm also the opinion you should know what the rules are for yourself and adhere to them perfectly about 80% of the time and then throw caution to the wind the rest of the time. Like I have muffins and pizzas and ice cream, and I also go low carb and paleo and primal for weeks at a time. So I have insulin that remains sensitive. I don't fall into a coma walking by a donut shop or something. Okay, you know? but give me a few foods that you think are really good for brain productivity and I don't brain think power. it's about what you eat as much as, I mean, all know the basics. It's about when you eat. So That's do you believe biggest, intermittent fasting is a yeah, big one for it's a brain huge, power? Huge, huge. And you need to allow the system to drop its uh, sort of building mode and move into a cleanup mode. And most of the aging and deterioration things we experience are accelerated by inflammation, what's called glycation or rusting from sugar. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of things in aging and brain development and brain performance can be enhanced by reducing sugars, by improving good fats, 
But then I think you also need to compress your eating and either do some sort of intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding where you're doing like a, you know, for women it's different. Women have to be very cautious about doing too short a window or you suppress hormone production pretty easily. So fasting completely, do you do that? Like, I do that, yeah. But, and I think it's better for women than, than, than intermittent fasting actually is to do longer fasting here and there. But um, I do like 20 hours of eating and four hours, so 20 hours of not eating, four hours of eating when I'm eating. And Wait, I, you do 20 hours fasting, of fasting. Four so hours what is of that? That's, there's something that um, Gabby, uh, when, sorry, Gabby Reese was on recently and mm -hmm. we were talking about this. She was saying her friend does that. It's a crazy diet. Yeah, I do 24. What's it called? That 20, it, there's a name for it when you only okay. eat for a four hour window. I usually eat for one hour actually, generally. I eat one meal. Uh, OMAD, one meal a day. That wasn't um, even it. That's crazy. And then I skip those meals every uh, once a week, skip one or two days. So I go 48 or 72 hours or more once a week. Without eating. Mm -hmm. But is this for your brain or is it just it's for everything? It's for, it's for everything. everything. It's for aging, it's for brain, it's for health, it's for everything. The brain kind of controls lots of stuff, but it's not just for my brain. So. You, what, what kind of, what kind of uh, results, what do you feel, how do you feel once you do that kind of fast? Well, in the middle of it, you feel kind of like it's not, you're on drugs because it's so much energy, so much you know, clarity, so much focus wow. once you get into ketone production. It's kind of a cheat. I, I kind of joke that it's like the entrepreneur's cheat is to not eat because you're too busy. <laughs> right. But like a day and a half later, you have so much energy and like, why is he sending all these emails at 4 a.m. or whatever? Like, it, it's a little crazy how much energy ketones can give you. So you believe in the keto, so you go into ketosis? Yeah. Yeah. You fat, and so you fast. How often did you say you do the 20 hour fast? Every day. Every uh, day? Yeah. So right now you're just gonna- I haven't eaten today, yeah. So what time do you have, what time do you time your meal? Right now my next meal is planned for 9.30 tomorrow morning. Can you drink uh, coffee? Yeah, I drink black coffee, water, and have some salt, some pink salt. You're not gonna eat till tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, and you said you do this how often? At least once a week I skip a day. I often skip two days once a week. So I'm doing 73 hour fast. Didn't we just have this conversation about, I don't know, 50 minutes ago when you said to me, what about the like joys of life? You know, yeah. when you, don't you like to eat? I do, I love it. And you deprive yourself. Well, you talk about being on autopilot. I talk about like starving yourself. Last time I had a three day fast, I, I broke it with a blueberry pie that I made and a roast, a Wagyu sirloin tip roast. And it's a blueberry delicious. pie. No, but my, you know? my point is you're not eat, like, aren't you just thinking of food the no, whole time? No, no, you're not hungry, you're not fixed food at all. No, no, the body's fine with doing it. Can you exercise? Absolutely, and gain muscle. Yeah. Because the growth hormone is like 6, 10, 100 times X what it is when you're not doing it. Okay, so. So your body shreds down. It's insane. I lost 40 pounds doing one meal a day from February through June. Because you're not eating, it's a calorie deficit. No, it wasn't. I was still eating three to 4,000 calories a day. So, okay. How, so you're, because you ate the blueberry, how much of the blueberry pie and that? Half what? of it. Pound and a half of the meat and, and half the pie. Do you also feel like you've like, like a sense of accomplishment in a way? I mean, the first couple times, when I got used to doing it, it was hard to do, but it's not hard to do anymore. My, my insulin's super sensitive, my body's happy to do it. I don't even notice it. I'm like, oh, I'm eating, to, okay, yeah, today's on eating day. Okay, great, whatever. So. so then this whole intermittent thing that I was talking about is like a cakewalk. Now, me. yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. In fact, eating more than once a day is a little annoying to me now. It messes with me a little bit. See, I guess it's because you retrained your brain to my think that My way. circadian system. Well, I think we're built to eat this way. I think we're built to eat big meals a couple times and then fast for a few days. And then eat a couple big meals and fast for a few days. I think we're, we're built to do this. Can you give me a couple other okay. hacks that you would do? Oh, yeah, so one. sleep is the biggest one. Right, well. And there's three big circadian tricks that people often do wrong. So a lot of my biohacker friends are really into like controlling light to, hit, to, to hack mm. your sleep. I'm not, I don't think light's a big deal. Or at least it's, kind of far down on the list. The highest things are um, sleep. And what controls sleep the most is when you eat. So the first rule for circadian rule, uh, entrainment is, or circadian hacking is, don't eat for three to four hours before bed. You have to have low insulin when you fall asleep to have the growth hormone surge two hours later. If you don't, if you get a bit of insulin in your system, you'll suppress growth hormone and you'll sleep lightly all night long. So that's the reason behind it. 
So you will suppress the growth hormone. Yep. And if you're north of 35, you're only getting growth hormone at that one pulse. Right. An hour and a half in the night, two hours in the night. That's it. So That's no, a good fact. That's a good so fact. So go to bed hungry, wake up refreshed and full of energy. Go to bed full, wake up hungry and tired. Well, you know, everyone always, I mean, like I said, this is not a new thing to like not eat before you go to sleep and all that. But I never heard it's because you're suppressing the growth hormone. Yep. Because insulin and growth hormone are mutually suppressive, basically. And the next most important rule for circadian entrainment is to get up at the same time every day, roughly. Half an yeah. hour plus or minus. When you go to bed, I don't care about. When you go to sleep, sorry, when you wake up, huge. Your evening time will sort itself out. Mm -hmm. You'll want to go to bed, you'll feel the reflex of, okay, time to go to bed. But if you have the morning time nice and entrained, the morning light is the only one that really does strong entrainment through the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus over the optic chiasm. The optic nerves. Oh, can, you, can you say that in, sure. in my language? The optic nerves have a cross, an X called a, the optic chi or chiasm okay. behind the eyes. On top of the optic chiasm is these little nuclei called the suprachiasmatic, the on top of the chiasm, nucleus. And its job is to sample the temperature of light coming in the retina and tell you what time of day it is. And it's very sensitive to a certain frequency of light that's only present in the first hour after dawn. The sun's too high in the sky and most frequencies of light are reflected back into space later in the day. But in the morning, that low horizon light is special color and the brain has circuits specifically known as that. So morning light is the key for circadian, not evening light stuff. So you don't believe, so how about like blue light and all that other stuff? It's about melatonin, but melatonin is a very weak effect. You can still have a fine circadian with no, no melatonin, but you can't have one with no vasopressin, which is what the suprachiasmatic nucleus is all about. So that the timing is about morning timing. Evening timing can have some impact. Women are more sensitive than men to evening timing mm. pushbacks because your circadian rhythm is a bit shorter anyways. So if you ate at night and I ate at night at the same time, it'll be worse for you circadian wise because you'll stretch your rhythm. And I won't stretch mine if it's early enough. Okay. Is there anything other one? And any yeah. The third one is get some exercise in the morning before you eat. See, this, this one's always very controversial because I need to eat to get to get some energy mm -hmm. before I exercise. Well, you might not be well adapted to. So it's training myself to not do it. And, and, and you may not be having good ketone production when you're fasting, which you should. Even after a single night of fasting, you should be able to have good ketones in the morning and, and also some good ghrelin suppression and cortisol. It's high. You should have no appetite and tons of energy when you wake up if all your hormones are kind of coming on board uh, online properly. You know what it is? It's also habit, right? You're so, I'm it's so used habit. to it. I've trained my brain to, you know, it's like Pavlov dog. I'm like yep. used to waking up, going to the kitchen, having my breakfast. Yeah, yeah. So I have to retrain it. So it'll take, do you say it's going to take five weeks? It'll take a to, few weeks to get in the habit and then about five weeks to cement is my guess. Yeah, yeah. So evening fasting for these three hours, morning working out, Sorry, morning waking time, the consistent morning working out. If you exercise in the morning fasted and you're uh, fat adapted, if you can burn fat pretty easily, you burn six times as much fat working out in the morning before you eat at the end of the day. Six times? Yeah. What if you, how do you know if, you're fa if, you, if you burn fat easily or not? Uh, the, can you go low carb and not notice it? You know, um, if you go low carb and you keep having energy dips, you have tons, you know. I mean, again, it's because you're used. To, it, it, all of this could be because you're used to it. How do you know if you're just? But your someone insulin's used to it? getting used to it. Yeah. Insulin regulates. It's a regulatory system. It learns and changes. If you eat keto or paleo or primal all the time, insulin becomes very sensitive and very ranging. If you eat sugar all the time, it goes up and stays up. Your cell, cells stop listening. So, what do you think of metformin? Do you know what that is? Metformin. Yeah, metformin. Sorry. Yeah. Because a lot of biohackers, I yeah. feel, take it because of the fact that. It like helps with your mm -hmm. glucose, you know, you Ins tell people, yeah. you're the Ins doctor. Insulin sensitivity, basically, Insulin, yeah. yeah. Um, there are lots of positives, apparently, from metformin, but I have a hunch we'll discover it causes lots of problems. Why? Because anything that seems to monkey with that regulatory pathway of energy has caused problems historically. What kind of problems? addiction, I'm, I'm thinking heart disease or brain diseases later on, you know, degenerative things, I don't know. But blood sugar is not something I, I think you should be messing with unless you absolutely need to. Right. Because there are so many factors regulating it. Right. That leaning with an aggressive external force on one of those, I don't like that. I never like that. But yeah, people are getting effects from it, better blood sugar regulation, anti-aging stuff. There was some increased risk in a couple of papers with animal models for some stroke or something. 
but I'm not sure. I, I think that for these biohackers, I think you have to walk the line. And if there's a supplement or a substance or a compound you want to play with, go for it, whatever, it's your brain. But I think we, uh, if you have a problem, a disorder, a disease, right, right. you should then maybe balance the side effect potentials against the benefits you're going to get. But if you're a biohacker who's just trying to squeeze a little more performance out, you should be very, very you know, resistant to allowing side effects in. Is there any supplement or nootropic or whatever that you believe works? I know that you were involved. Yeah, most of them do. You believe in it. Like, yeah, yeah, again, a yeah. lot of people say that it's a, it's, a, it's a money maker. Well, that's because the word nootropic is used as a marketing, a marketing word, not a true. I mean, the, the, the word really means things that improve brain performance with no side effects. Okay. So right. modafinil is not a nootropic. Caffeine is not a nootropic. No. You know, and there are some nootropics that fit into the sort of herb and, sol and, and vitamin category. Okay, give us a couple that like, you think um, work. Uh, if you have anxiety, and acetylcysteine is often amazing for, as a nootropic. Or um, uh, tyrosine as a dopamine precursor can help a lot for executive function for some people. Or magnesium. Magnesium is a huge one. What does magnesium really help? Could you give me a breakdown of what actually it does and what it helps with? Many things. It's helping mostly with, well, combination with muscle relaxation. Right and with um, nerve firing. So nerves use magnesium to fire, among other things. A lot of fitness people use it, of course. Yeah, and that's they mostly for muscle recovery. And, and for sleep. I mean, the, the effects, yeah, sleep, um, yeah. the quality of sleep improvements, magnesium exceed that of melatonin dramatically. So you get a much mm -hmm. better sleep improvement mm -hmm. on magnesium. But again, it's an essential sort of mineral we need, and so if you supplement it, great. The, the trick of magnesium nootropically is that people often don't absorb it very well. And so you find that if you need magnesium, if you have gut issues, then you should probably do multiple formats of magnesium, not just one. Uh, or you should bypass the gut to get it into your system. So one way you can get magnesium into your system is using magnesium oil. Mm, like cover cover your legs with it, and it's bath. Huge amounts of mass of magnesium into your system directly through the skin. So you put it in a bath. You just use it on your like as a moisturizer out of the, I'm just come out of the bath or the shower. That's a good and that's like very okay. That's a good one. So, um, let's see, magnesium tyrosine, uh, L-theanine, which is the amino acid found in tea leaves, balances caffeine beautifully. So if you use caffeine as a lifestyle drug, get a little bit of L-theanine in there, will kind of make it smooth instead of pushy. Um, there's a lot of them. And then, then you have the, the synthetic category, the first nootropics, which are the racetams, paracetam, antiracetam, oxyracetam, phenylparacetam, pramuracetam, oxy, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, 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 okay. And those are all derived from the neurotransmitter GABA. Those were like one step away from GABA, uh, which is a naturally occurring neurotransmitter. It makes you calm. Wow. But most of the racetams have effects on learning and attention. They're kind of, you know, research chemicals and... Is there a supplement people can take to help them focus, to simply focus? No. But no. And it won't work the same across people. I mean, yeah, L-tyrosine, as a tyrosine precursor, will boost your dopamine. For some people, that will be like taking Adderall. For most, it won't. Right. If you, so it's if kind you, of trial and error, too, a lot of it. And, and it's being smart. I mean, a good functional medicine doc can go, oh, you have altered, you know, gene metabolism for dopamine. Ah, we should give you some L-tyrosine. Or you've altered, you know, methylation for B vitamins. Ah, give you some methyl, you know, mm -hmm. cobalamin. And, and they can shore up your metabolic pathways that way and, and dial things in. But I think for the average person, nootropics should be used to just boost day to day. And you should have very low key things, some supplements, some vitamins, and dial in one or two cognitively activated things for you, like L-tyrosine, L-theanine. Is it a myth that omega-3s, though, just basic omega-3s, help with brain function? They, they dramatically do, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, specifically DHA. You didn't say that one though. You forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, I did forget that one. Yeah. Yeah. DHA. DHA. And vitamin D as well. Also nootropic, very right. subtly. Yeah, I take but the that thing one. is, when I think nootropics, I think things you feel. You don't usually feel, some people do feel uh, omega-3s. Most people don't feel vitamin D, omega-3s. You'll feel tyrosine, generally, or magnesium, I'm gonna generally. write that down. And what did you say tyrosine was good for? Dopamine. Dopamine. It's a dopamine precursor. Like so L-tyrosine uh, okay. is better than straight, you know, but yeah, and there's many others, um, but none of these things will shore up a crappy diet or leaky gut. Of course, or... of course. These are just like, these are just in, just kind of extras yeah, that you can yeah. do to kind of just elevate your brain power or your overall health. 
Um, wow. but, but I would okay. rather you meditate for 20 minutes a day than start playing with nootropics. Oh yeah, of course. You know, this or is... stop eating sugar versus looking for... Oh, absolutely. You know, like, I'm, I'm a believer in what you're saying. I think it's a lot of this. People want the, the, the magic bullet and the quick route. And, 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 and that's is... the issue in the nootropic field is people searching for that right. instead of using it to shore up and gap fill and, you know, absolutely. work on things. Like my mom... I, she's on nootropic. She takes a bunch of them and I have her on a whole bunch of interesting things and she runs out every few months and calls me and says, send more because, she, you know, we're concerned about some cognitive stuff yeah. and she doesn't have any cognitive issues at all. But she wants to make sure the next 20 years are the same. So we dialed in a very low key strategy for based on the family history and her own great nutrition and activity. Can this help with uh, or actually any of this stuff, or especially neurofeedback with Alzheimer's in? Neurofeedback probably can't help too much. It might slow down progression, make progression. the brain more plastic. Mm -hmm. But for Alzheimer's, I would go into the metabolic approaches. The um, Brazenin program, we're looking at the 39 factors or so that, that drive up uh, the synaptoclastic. The brain turns into a synapse-consuming machine versus mm -hmm. synapse-building machine when it's under stress as an immune function thing. And it looks like amyloid is a basic immune mo modulator in the brain that fights against microbes. Next time I'm gonna bring a Webster dictionary because I, I mean, thank you. <laughs> I mean, your, your vocabulary, I gotta like really pay attention. I just talk fast, it's my East Coast, no. sorry. No, 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 uh, it's great. I mean, this has been, I'm sorry, I've kept you here forever. That's all right, um, it's my day off. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, where where can people find you and where yeah. more information? Because I've kept you here. It's like way over the time that you probably thought you would ever have to like sit and walk on a treadmill. That's right. That's right. I, I didn't do my yoga today. I have, <laughs> I have, I have a sprained thumb. I can't put pressure on my hand. So. I remember that sprained thumb. Uh, this is my workout, I guess, for the day. Maybe, yes, this exactly. How many calories did you burn? Press the uh, white button. The white button? Yeah. 166. Oh. But it doesn't have my weight, right? Well, exactly. Does it, does, exactly. Does it do it? It doesn't have, no, no, no. You no. have to put it yeah, all in so. there. All right, well, still, but still you moved. I moved. You got, you got your body moving, which, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we spoke, we got your brain kind of thinking hopefully Kinda. better with the, with the treadmill. Um, where do people find you? So uh, we're at Peak Brain LA or Peak Brain Institute, all of our socials. Our website's Peak Brain Institute. Um, we have physical offices in Los Angeles, in Orange County, in uh, St. Louis, in London, and in Malmo, Sweden. Oh, and wow. Uh, we also do workshops around the world. So we have workshops in New York City and Amsterdam and London all happening this year. Because we do a lot of self-training, teach you how to train your own brain in a workshop. I didn't get to that. Yeah, it's okay. Next time. Next it'll, time. Come, it'll come on again. Sure. So yeah, Peak Burn LA or Peak Burn Institute. And I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm at Andrew Hill PhD on socials as well. Well, you've been at pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. And we'll uh, hopefully have you again next time. We'll go into the self, how we do it, how you can actually do this at home alone. But you got to tune in again. That's right. Teaser. Yeah, teaser. Exactly. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast powered by Habit Nest.